to the Kiwi Man here from the Kiwi Mana Buzz and uh, today we've got Kevin Ingram from the BK Corner and Phil Chandler, the Barefoot Beekeeper. So uh, how's it going guys and yeah, how's it going? <laughs> I'm good. I'm going good. And maybe we just talk, go around the room and tell each other, um, tell the audience about what we're doing and who we are. So maybe we start with uh, Phil. Sure, okay. Um, I'm Phil Chandler. I'm in the UK, in England, um, to be more specific, Southwest England. Um, I'm probably best known for, for what we call natural beekeeping. Back, <clears throat> let me start that sentence again. <laughs> I'm probably best known for what we call natural beekeeping over here. And um, I use mostly top bar hives, but I do play around with other hives as well. Um, purely out of interest. I didn't really do any honey production at all, um, except a little bit for my own use, family use and friends and so on. Um, and my interest is in bees and how to go about keeping them in a way that is uh, gives them as much freedom as possible to do what bees do and still allow us to have some sort of interaction with them. So that that's really it, top and bottom. Oh, fantastic. And uh, Kevin, you're from New Jersey, aren't you? I am. I live uh, in New Jersey, central New Jersey, just west of the Pennsylvania border. I'm a hobby beekeeper, uh, what do they call them, serious sideliner, as they say. I only have three hives right now, but I'm looking to uh, go up to uh, 10 hives this year and doing this since 2008, and I have a beekeeping podcast at bkcorner.org and do a lot with the state local beekeeping associations fantastic and um well i'm gary i've um i'm sort of a sideline beekeeper as well we've got 15 hives at the moment and yeah we try and do our ours without using chemicals at all so but we're using mainly langstrip hives at the moment we're probably looking at doing some um bench hives later on over winter we'll make some give that a go yeah and so to start off things we've got a um, video from um, dr peter teal that kevin's talk wants to talk about was that what was it a recent conference kevin yeah in january i went and attended the american beekeeping uh, federation conference at hershey pennsylvania and it's one of those things where when you leave your head hurts because there's just so much stuff that's going on you can't possibly see it all uh, everything from commercial guys that have the largest operations in the United States to beekeepers like myself who have only a handful of hives and everything in between they have standard regular tracks that you can go through and learn many different things they have scientists locked in the basement where they just talk about research that isn't even released yet and they have uh, different tracks that just cover the industry itself. Uh, the fascinating one that I wanted to talk about was out of the USDA Agricultural Research Service, Gainesville, Florida lab, Dr. Peter Thiel did a presentation on Friday afternoon. I almost missed this. I had another presentation that I just kind of had fatigue and I went up to the general session room to sit it out and took in this presentation and uh, let me tell you what it was and I just covered this on my podcast which got released this week. They have the answer to the small hive beetle and varroa mite problem or at least the closest that I've seen since I've been involved in beekeeping. Uh, they've come up with this method at least for the small hive beetle where they found out that they can build and attract it like a lure that is so strong that it will actually draw the small hive beetle out of the ground and into the trap almost like a Japanese beetle trap but it will literally draw the small hive beetle out of the hive itself and they've been able to figure out that they could use cantaloupe but in Florida the cantaloupe rot right away so it's attractive for a moment and then it's not attractive anymore because it's rotted. Well, they can isolate the chemical from that and use that and create a synthetic blend, and they're working on a product for that. The other thing that they had was a, a plexiglass contraption that you put on the front of the bottom board, and you catch the larvae as they're crawling out of the hive. And the larvae, if you could stop them from getting in the ground and pupating, 
then you're going to prevent them from becoming adults, and you could put a serious dent on the small hive beetle population in your apiary. The million dollar one was that they took old hive beetles, and they put them in the soil, and they had this big tub, and they had fresh soil, not, not polluted at all with hive beetles, and old, and they discovered that the heart, the larvae would only go in the fresh soil, would not go in the old. And they determined that the small hive beetle carcasses in the soil from pupating was what kept them from doing it. So the key thing that they did was they took all these small hive beetle carcasses and they put it in a pan. They drew a line straight through the middle of the pan. And they took all this larvae and they put it in one side and they let them go to see what would happen. Not one of them would crawl across the carcasses to get to the other side. They were stacked five deep but they would not crawl. That was really, really cool what they did. So then they took the larvae and they mixed it with pentane, the crushed uh, old shells, and they sprayed half of a disc about the size of a pizza, and they put the larvae on it. None of them would crawl to the other side. Then they took this same thing and they put the larvae straight down on the part that got painted, and they all crawled off to the free side. So they're pretty clear that they can create wow. this attractant that will do push-pull for small hive beetle. And it's such a big problem for certain parts of the United States. Then, to top it off, and I said in the podcast it was a lot like uh, an infomercial where, wait, there's more. They asked this question, what is it that the varroa mite is attracted to inside the hive? Is it the larvae? Is it the brood? Is it the honey? What is it? Well, it turns out the answer is it's the adult bee. Straight out the adult bee. So then they took the adult bee, and this is a little bit squeamish, but they basically wrung it out. They separated the juices of the bee from the solids of the bee, and they put the solid in, so they squeezed the, the juices out of the bee. Mm. And they put the hard part back, and the, the mites weren't interested. Then they took the juices, and they put it back on the bee, and the mites weren't interested. So they had to figure out what was going on here. They took that juice, and they froze it. I'm going to, this is all scientific. I'll be very simple for the description. And they divided it into its separate parts. Fractions is what they refer to it as. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it split into two things. It split into a frozen solid and a liquor, which would not freeze. <laughs> they put the liquor on. Mites not interested. They put the solid juice back on, and the mites went crazy over it. So now they know what it is that's attracting the mites. Okay. What Dr. Mm. Teal said was, the fascinating part is, now they have a repellent in the liquid part, and they have an attractant in the solid part, mm. and they could use this as a push-pull system to do the same thing with the mites. And, oh, by the way, it's made out of a natural product, which is the actual honeybee. So it's not sure. like they have some methyl ethyl death product that they yeah. got it. They got it right from the bee. So I think they can go pretty far with this. This was a really cool uh, session that he had. And if you go look up Dr. Teal, I found something on YouTube. I didn't watch it. found it this morning before I went out. Um, there's some presentation more about the science on this. That was available from, I'm going to say, University of Florida presentation that he did last August. So uh, I was really excited about that particular session of all the things I saw there. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I mean, that, um, Ross Con Conrad's book, have you read that? It's got a, they've got a varroa trap in there. I'm wondering if you could use that in that to trap the mites inside it. It's, like a, it's, it's basically like a frame with, um, like, steel on each side so they can't the mites get in but they can't get out Sim similar idea it sounds like there's so many different ideas yeah. about the varroa mite i was watching a youtube video this morning i went to a beekeeping meeting for the new jersey state beekeepers today and uh, while i was waiting for my ride i found the fat bee man had a video where he was saying if you take um, ground up or no, it wasn't ground up. It was shavings from a planer of a certain type of wood and put it in your smoker that it would 
kill the mites or be a deterrent. So there's there's still so much things to, to figure out when it comes to try and solve this varroa mite yeah. problem. And the New Jersey State Apiary said today, still the number one problem with all the things going on, CCD notwithstanding, is a varroa mite in New Jersey. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, similar here, I think. The mites are still a big problem. How about in England, Phil? Um, yeah, well, you know, I hear conflicting stories. Um, I don't find them too much of a problem. Um, I've been keeping bees treatment free now. Um, certainly, I didn't do any treatment that I can remember last season. I don't think I used even powdered sugar last season. Um, the season before, I used a little bit of powdered sugar on some of the hives, but I've got a couple of hives, let me think. I've got a couple, three maybe, that I've had that will have gone through um, at least two complete seasons without any treatment at all. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I've solved the problem or anything like it. You know, it, just, it may just mean that the, the mite load in those particular uh, colonies is low enough um, that the bees can stay on top of it. Um, but my my whole approach these days is to work on the idea that what I'm trying to do is to create um, an environment in the hive that is maximally conducive to the bees and minimally conducive to any of their their friends or their, their enemies, should I say. Um, but that means looking at um, what might be the friends of the bees, and just to bring in my, the name of my own charity. <laughs> but what I mean by that, uh, what I mean specifically by that, is that um, there are some bugs and some mites even that are known to be, um, or believed to be, beneficial to bees. And they live quite happily with, with the bees inside the, uh, the hollow trees. And they're naturally occurring everywhere, certainly in this country. Um, there's a there's a there's a genus called Stratiolelaps, which is um, a favourite at the moment with some of the uh, researchers, and what they're finding is that if you um, if you introduce these mites, the Stratiolelaps mites, to the hive, that they actually can do a pretty good pretty good job of controlling the varroa. So that's like one mite being used to control another mite, which is uh, an approach that I you know totally approve of and would would actively encourage. Yeah, it's, it sounds like, um, have you heard of pseudoscorpions? They apparently have a similar thing. Yes, indeed, yeah, yeah, very similar idea, yeah. But the, the yeah. pseudoscorpions, I think, are, I think I'm right in saying, aren't native to, to this country, whereas the stratiolelaps mites are. So it, the point with it is that it, that it doesn't involve introducing another species with unknown consequences. It means, you know, using what we've already got, what, what's already out there, and... Um, so what I'm doing is to, rather than regarding the hive as a, you know, as a sterile box that we have to kill everything in first before we can put the bees in, I'm treating it much more like um, a natural living um, hollow log style uh, ecosystem. So I've been experimenting with this deep floor idea, and um, that seems to be working pretty well because the, the deep floor contains some of the material that you would otherwise find on the forest floor or inside the hollow log. And that's what the, um, the stratiolelaps and the earwigs and the wood lice, you know, that's the sort of environment they like to live in. And I think those, those things are uh, creatures that we, we know so little about that we need to maybe encourage them a bit and just see how they get on because they seem to get on perfectly happily with bees, you know, and, yeah. and, and maybe they're just ha happy living together and maybe they help each other out, you know. Oh, that sounds promising, there was doesn't a session, it? Uh, there was a session at AVF it, about that particular, the fauna and whatever inside the hive, they talked about mm -hmm. the soft ceilings and the and the cushy floors, and yep. uh, specifically they were looking at the bacteria in the hive. And we just went to see Michael Bush recently. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a well-known bee being oh, naturalist, yeah. and his whole discussion was about how, for example, when you put sugar water in the hive, it changes the pH. Sugar water is not uh -huh. the same pH of honey. And it allows sure. different things to grow in the hive that would never grow there. For example, That's very true. yeast will grow differently. And his, mm -hmm. his expectation was that even essential oils and anything that you could put in the hive is messing with mm -hmm. the ecosystem 
and we should be going back to something more like what you're discussing, a natural floor, a natural ceiling, and just sure. leave them be and let them live and build their ecology inside. Absolutely. I have, I, have a, I have a lot of time for Michael Bush. I've read a lot of his stuff, and I've, I've exchanged messages with him on forums and things. And, um, you know, he, he always talks good sense, and I, I, I'm very happy to, to uh, be guided by him on a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a, good, he's got a great website, hasn't he? He's got some really useful yeah. information on it. Absolutely. <coughs> okay. I think just about any time you encounter him and read his information, you say, that makes sense, or he, he mm -hmm. typically provides enough backstory to explain himself, and we spent a whole day with him last week in Philadelphia, and just really a big fan of uh, the presentation. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, I say this in a nice way, I think I mentioned this on my podcast, is that I've seen different beekeepers, they're just regurg regurgitating what people have said, but he's sure. actually, he's like a Randy Oliver, he's looking at the science and taking it one level Mm. Yeah. Uh, apparently, he's quite a good guitar player too. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. I I have apparently. recordings of him <coughs> singing from last week. Actually, he sang Excellent. three okay. songs and I recorded them. So yeah, he was pretty good. Mm -hmm. I have to say. Oh, cool. Yeah, I I, re I read um, Linda's B blog and he, he she had some photos of him playing his guitar. So hmm. quite Linda good. Tillman, yeah. Yeah, she's he, got a great blog too. He was recorded the whole time the Philadelphia Beekeeping Guild was the host for this. We went to, I guess, Northeast Philadelphia for it, and they recorded the whole session. I have to believe that they'll probably put that up on their website. And I also mm. know that he went down in the Shenandoah Valley and did the presentation that we saw, and it's up on Vimeo. So if you're interested, you can find this stuff out there. Sure. Okay, we'll uh, we'll try and find that and add it to the, to the show notes for the for the call. Yeah, and there's some good news in Europe, isn't there, Phil? With um, a lot of sort of Home Depot kind of stores are, are banning near nicotinoid pesticides, aren't they? Well, it's so, starting so. to look hopeful. Yeah, um, there's a lot going on here at the moment, actually, because um, as you know, we're we're uh, like it or not part of Europe, <laughs> politically as well as geographically, and. Um, there is a movement, it's quite a strong movement in Europe, uh, moving against the, the neonicotinoids. I mean, there's been a lot of research, and there's at least 30 pieces of scientific re research has shown that neonicotinoids are damaging to bees. And uh, despite, you know, Bayer still claiming that, you know, there's nothing to do with them and it's all the fault of the varroa mite, um, there's an awful lot of people that think that neonicotinoids are doing an awful lot of damage. So there's a lot of pressure from from Europe, from other countries in Europe specifically, to have neonicotinoids banned across Europe. And of course, uh, Bayer and Syngenta and the like are battling hard against that um, because obviously that's going to undermine their profit margin somewhat. Um, so we've got an interesting situation happening in, in, in the UK now where some uh, big stores, we, we have a, it's like a B, a B and Q, which is a big DIY store, and also Wix and Homebase, which are two other DIY stores, which also have, they tend to have garden departments in their stores. Um, they have um, voluntarily come out and said that they're not going to sell any garden pesticides that contain neonicotinoids. So that's a really good first step. Now the next thing we're trying to do is work on the supermarkets because we have some big supermarket chains here, Tesco's and Sainsbury's, Waitrose and so on, that um, do sell some products still which contain neonicotinoids. So we're at the moment just putting some pressure on them to see if we can persuade them to join the DIY stores and uh, get it, you know, again, not, not, not ban them, but just remove them from the shelves as a gesture of support for, for bees and beekeepers um, until such time as we get a clear, you know, ruling on the issue from, from, uh, from the European Parliament. But the trouble is our government, um, bless their hearts, have been also got at. They've been lobbied heavily by Bayer and Syngenta and our government is actually looks like voting against the uh, European move to to ban neonics. So uh, there there are 
you know, there's, there's quite a big conflict going on at the moment. We, towards the end of this month, there's going to be a vote in the European Parliament, which will settle the matter for the time being. Um, but, the, you know, I, I suspect that uh, our government will scupper the, the, the plan to ban neonics because they've been, uh, they've been got at by the industry. So, you know, it's a big battle going on, and it's going to go on for a while yet because the, the amount of money involved behind the scenes is huge. You know, Bayer made something yeah, like 35, so 35 billion, do, billion euros, you know, which equates to $35 billion, pretty much one for one, um, just last year, just selling this stuff, you know. So it's not, uh, it's not small beer we're talking about. So they can, they can afford good lawyers then? Oh, yeah. Or can they? Can they ever, yeah. 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 So if, if it was passed in the European um, Parliament, would that affect England as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> we pretty much have to do what we're told as far as you know being in Europe is concerned. I mean, there's a move at the moment to get us out of Europe, but that's a whole another story, you know. But um, at the moment, if if Europe passes a law, then we pretty much have to go with it. Yeah, I think there are one or two exceptions yeah. that we can opt out of, but you know, it's not much really. Yeah. That's true. It's it's fascinating to understand the different government approaches to these things because yeah. just the fact that they're considering it there, I I never hear anybody considering it here. Here it's it's a foregone conclusion that unless you have some super condemning science, they're just not going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we need to talk to our um companies here about it because they're actually using Bayer's products in their pesticides so mm -hmm. but they don't they don't see any link apparently so they you know it's very hard to convince them yeah well it's, there, it's not an easy thing to a, spot you know go ahead what was it there, go there's ahead, been a lot of discussion mm -hmm. about the fact that the problem is really about the delivery right wasn't the original science for these things is once they're in the ground they shouldn't really get a lot of impact to the bee. I know we talk about the sublethal. I know in the U.S. they're talking about solving the seed coating problem because the dust is coming off and yeah. going out. That's really where the exposures are coming from. But it's guttural that well, things are leaking juices out of the plant. You see, the, the problem is that the, the, the neonicotinoids, the problem with them is that they are systemic, and that means that they are... They start off on the seed coating, but they're taken up into the vascular system of the plant. You know, they're, they're drawn into the plant itself um, through the system that transport water and, and therefore nutrients around the plant. So those neonicotinoids end up in the leaves, in the stem, in the flower, in the pollen, in the nectar, uh, in, in very small doses. But this stuff is incredibly toxic, you know. And the, the, the analogy that keeps coming up, and it's one I worked out some time ago, because um, I couldn't understand, you know, when, when people talk in terms of parts per, parts per thousand, I can understand. Parts per million, I can just about, you know, get a grasp on. But parts per billion is just like, well, you know, you might as well be talking about astronomy, really. And, um, but the way that we visual, well, I, that I figured out how to visualize it is that, if you put one teaspoonful of this stuff, of, of clothianidin or imidacloprid, one teaspoonful, or five milliliters, um, into a thousand metric tons of water, that equates to five parts per billion. You know? So it's like, it's like a teaspoonful of stuff in a, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, if you like. That any, means any drop of that liquid is capable of killing a bee. And the you know the French experiments have found that five parts per billion will kill bees. Anything below that, between one and five parts per billion, will have irreversible effects on the nervous system of the bee, which disorientates them. And as you, as everybody here knows, the, a disoriented bee is a dead bee. You know, a bee that can't find its way home is dead. You know, as good as yeah. straight away, it's dead. Um, so anything that is capable of disorientating a bee in quantities down to sort of one or two parts per billion has got to be one of the most toxic substances ever <laughs> spread on the land, you know, really. And it's not, 
it's not the fact, I mean, the dust thing was the, that's the thing that always comes up with the German experience back in May 2008 when they planted all that uh, maize seed across Germany, across the, the Rhine Valley. And that then, yes, there was dust. Dust came off the seed and that created instant death right across something like 17,000 beekeepers were wiped out, I think, that day. Um, and, uh, you know, millions and millions of bees dead, dead of course. But it's not so much those instant knockdown effects that we're concerned about. It's the fact that this stuff gets into the plant, into the flower, into the nectar, into the pollen, and then gets taken back to the hive. And because you've got, you know, maybe 50,000 workers concentrating that stuff into the small space that is the hive, that's where the toxic effect happens. And this is what, you know, we believe is causing the, the, the CCD issues because it, it creates... Um, you know, individually, those little grains of uh, microscopic grains of, of toxin that are out in the field may not do very much, but when they're all brought back into the hive and concentrated that way, that's what seems to be doing the damage. And uh, you know, it's it's hard to get your head around just how toxic this stuff really is. But believe me, it's it's pretty amazingly powerful. Yeah, and the other thing is the residual thing, isn't it? Because it stays in the ground for years oh, yeah. and years, doesn't it? Doesn't oh, break yeah, down. Absolutely. Well, it does and break it, um, down, but, and, but but unfortunately, some of the breakdown products are even worse than the yes, original chemicals yeah. that they put on there. You know, that's pretty yeah. I, 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 I know. It, um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hey, I, I heard if it gets into the waterways, it actually's been known to kill um, fish as well. Definitely, yeah. Kills fish, kills birds, kills anything in its path. You know, it really is very toxic stuff. Yeah. No, I think I think it'd be a good move to ban it. To be honest. Because I, I think there there's areas there in France. A... Yep. Sorry. Um, I was going to say there's areas in France where they did, they have stopped it in a reduced way, and the bees have actually come back. Apparently. Yeah. I, I believe so. so. Yeah. So that, so that's proof, really, isn't it? There was a discussion today from the New Jersey State Apers. He's been taking samples for the USDA, and he's been going around to hives and collecting the pollen. And I think his, I'm going to do this off the fly, so I hopefully I don't get it wrong, but it was something like two, two to 11 pesticides found in, in a vast majority of the pollen, a high percentage, right? Yeah. And if these pesticides are there, and the USDA, the problem, listen, I, I don't understand why people don't get it the European way, which is if there's in doubt, take it out until you prove it. In the USDA, sure. you have to kill everything before, you know, and it, and that's not a thing on that. Look, they do all their science or whatever, but, you know, to your point, if the leaves are have got all liquids on them and the bees are taking it in because they're thirsty, they're going to get it. And yeah. the fact that this sublethal dose thing has been out there so long and has been discussed since the beginning of CCD, but the methodology to trace it, track it, do something with it, it's just not there. The science hasn't caught up with the problem, and we're not going to solve this problem until the science catches up. And Michael Bush was saying last week that even the fluvalinate and the cumafos that come, as they all know, everybody quotes it, it comes in the hive through the foundation, and mm -hmm. it just seeps out of the foundation into all the wax. It's permeable. Sure. It just goes everywhere, right? Sure. They have to solve these problems. You can't put pesticides inside a box full of insects. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And the worst thing is, of course, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the worst thing is, of course, that um, I, I guess it's probably the same in, in, in America, uh, certainly is what happens here is that at the end of the season, all the beekeepers put all their wax together and they send it off to uh, a central place and it gets put into a big pot and melts it down again and turned back into foundation and any, and redistributed around the country you know so whatever stuff that people choose to put on their bees and it you know by all means ain't all legal um and certainly isn't all safe all goes back into a big pot and gets spread around the country again in the foundation you know if you <laughs> if you wanted to put together a crazy plan to yeah. to, to wipe out bees that would be one of the things you'd do isn't it really yeah, it's almost absolutely. like taking them all to California to pollinate almonds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's not, that's another good way of getting rid of them. And of course, the um, the other thing that, uh, that 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 
that Bayer did, of course, was to persuade us that when, as soon as we got Varroa in this country, and uh, I have my suspicions as to how it got here, but that's another story, but as soon as we got Varroa in this country, um, of course, we were told immediately to use um, pyrethroids uh, made by Bayer um, to kill the Varroa mites. And, of course, <laughs> it, it, to start with, it kind of looked like it was working, and Bayer sold an awful lot of this stuff to beekeepers. And then, of course, uh, <laughs> at the same time, those same family of chemicals, the pyrethroids, were also being sprayed on the fields. This was before the, the neonicotinoids were be widely used. So out in the fields there, the bees were getting a low-level dose of pyrethroids, yeah, picking up on the pollen and everything else, at the same time that they were being dosed with a higher dose of pyrethroids inside the hive. And so um, it came to pass, uh, along with, I think, accompanied by some commercial beekeepers who decided that if, um, if leaving those strips inside the hive was six weeks was good, then leaving them in for six months must be better. <laughs> so uh -oh. they subjected, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You know, so bees from two directions were being subject to low-level doses of medication. Yeah, and of course, what happens is as the varroa reproduce rather rapidly, um, they adapted, and now, of course, what we've got is a whole lot of varroa of uh, pyrethroid-resistant varroa. Uh, so we've killed, you know, thanks to Bayer, we've killed off all the weak mites. And that we're now left with the tough mites that we can't kill. <laughs> you know? yeah. So now yeah. everybody has to find a new solution to it. And, you know, <laughs> you have to suspect, I mean, maybe I'm being paranoid here, but, you know, you have to wonder how Varroa spread around the country so damn quickly, how it got here in the first place. And uh, considering how much money Bayer have made out of selling insecticides to beekeepers that didn't really work, <laughs> you, know, you have to wonder if they didn't have a bigger hand in all this whole thing than, than they're owning up to. But maybe that's just me yeah. being, you know, a conspiracy theorist. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I could speak a... both sides of this, right? Because my hives <sighs> literally sit four feet from a cornfield. I've talked to the... I'm, I'm, I have a good relationship with the farmer. It's got gaucho in it. I mean, I know what mm -hmm. he's planting in a... Imacloprid, right? Right yeah. at my doorstep. Yeah. yeah. My bees have survived over and over. I'm using, I do have foundation in my hives. It's got fluvalinate and comp, you know, so, you mm -hmm. know, I, I've seen vanishing of the bees. I know what this is all about, but me personally, mm -hmm. hasn't hit home yet, right? My bees are overwintering. Sure. If bees are going to die, it's probably because I'm not a good beekeeper or doing crazy <laughs> things like, you know, my experiments of not feeding and stuff like that, right? Um, well, it, it may be that, uh, you know, they've got enough other forage around that whatever the farmer's planting that, that's been treated isn't the main thing that they're being attracted to. And maybe they're just not picking up of, you know, enough of it to, to cause them too much of an issue at the moment. I think that's I really hope. key is I have a reasonable forage area and mm -hmm. whatever, when that corn is in tassel, they fly right over because there's something better sure. for them, right? Sure. And everybody's yeah. experience can be different. If you're out in the middle of Iowa where there's nothing but corn, mm -hmm. you could potentially be toast, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it, all this research? And, um, yeah, no, it's, get rid of it, I say. It's my opinion. Well, um, you got anything else to bring up, Kevin? Any, any other yeah, just wanted to... Uh, to say that, uh, Phil, I'm working on building one of your hives. I took your oh, okay. plans from your website. Thank you very much. I'm building my first top bar hive and just looking to do some. I've been a beekeeper for a number of years as a as a backyard guy, and I know the I can keep my bees surviving year after year. I mm -hmm. know the conventional wisdom of how to do it, and now what I'm trying to do is branch out and learn different methodology, and that's kind of what my podcast is about is people following whatever sure. I'm doing plus I bring whatever I, so first time I'm going to build a top bar hive uh, I happen to be fortunate enough to win a cedar hive at oh, awesome. a beekeeping conference last October so I'm going to put one of those in the yard I just saw and shots of video of a dealer around here that's building wary hives I'm going to consider mm -hmm. that you'll, you'll appreciate this is that I asked the New Jersey State Apiarist this, this afternoon 
What do you think about these high form factors? I know that everybody has ubiquitous Langstroth, but what about the mite problems for those? And he kind of looked across the room funny at me. We have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. And he said, I really don't see that much difference. And then he went off to, you know, it has to be movable comb. Wanted to make sure mm -hmm. everybody knew that because it's a requirement in New Jersey. But, um, yeah, I'll have to have a sidebar conversation with him, not in front of public and ask him that question. But mm -hmm. I'm just curious how people are faring. Uh, in your experience, for top bar hives or whatever, you see any difference in the in the mites and how they, uh, I guess, mm. the best way to say well, it is, do they grow at the same rate as a Langstroth and all that? I was always curious about the form factor having any impact. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you, the problem is that there are so many variables, as you know. I mean, there, there, are, <laughs> it's it's very hard to say unless you unless you line up, you know, fifty hives of, of one type and fifty times of another type in the same sort of conditions with the same breed of bees, you know, sister queens, all that kind of stuff. It's very hard to make those sort of judgments. But what I have noticed fairly consistently is that the top bar hives seem to need less feeding. They seem to look after themselves better, you know. Um, I've given uh, my, all my hives. I mean, last year was rubbish here. The winter was the, the, the sorry. The summer was appalling in in this country last year. I mean, it was wet and cold and horrible. And I've noticed that the hives I've got that are on. I've still got a few framed hives uh, that I run just to keep you know just 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 to can make a comparison. Um, those hives all needed feeding. The top bar hives. Um, I gave them some fondant going into winter just to make sure that they were okay, and they hardly seems to have touched it. Um, by comparison with the with the framed hives, they're just not taking as much food. Now I'm hoping that that means they're, that they they've got enough of their own, and as you know, I'm hoping that means they're not just lazy or, or or they can't be bothered to feed themselves. But you know, we'll we'll know in a in a month's time how they've done through the winter. But what, all I can say is that they seem to thrive um, in the top bar hives. Um, I've got a couple of worries. No, I've only got one worry running at the moment. I have tried worries, and I intend to do more with worries just because I want to learn more about them. Um, but they do seem to work best with Italian bees because the Italian bees, as you know, have that... Um, you know, they, they expand very rapidly and, and they're, 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 yeah. they have that kind of strong urge to build comb and they will, they will build comb down through the boxes, uh, whereas the, the northern European bees aren't quite so enthusiastic about comb building and they, too, they, they seem to get stuck. A lot of people have said this. They seem to get stuck in the, the first or second box of the warre and they won't just keep on building downwards like the Italians do. So... You know, and I'm reluctant to get Italian, specifically Italian bees, just for that purpose. I mean, we have quite a lot of Italian, uh, you know, bees with Italian blood around here. But uh, because I'm only, you know, five or six miles from where Brother Adam used to have his, uh, w was raising his, uh, the Buckfast bees, of course. And uh, this area is absolutely flooded with Buckfast blood, which, of course, is really just a, you know, cr a Italian northern bee cross, mainly. So we've got a lot of mongrels in the area. So what can I say? The mongrels seem to do well. You know, the local mongrels seem to be okay. They seem to get by. Um, the the fancier breeds, I don't know. I don't have so much contact with them, but I get the impression that people who import bees, and I've seen people who've bought in New Zealand queens and things. You know, they just they haven't really done that well around here, and you know. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it's because they're adapted to the local area, isn't it? That's well, it's, really, yeah, it makes sense, you know. Yeah. Well, I've got a question here from Paul, uh, Paul Vandenbosch. He says, is it, is it ethical not to use any treatment on a new beehive? I'm starting to get a new worry hive this year and not plan to treat the hive in any way. So uh, what do you guys think? Well, what it's worth, I mean, I, I don't go around telling people not to treat, you know. I, I don't feel it's my business to tell people how to keep their bees. All I do is I try to keep doing experiments and I keep trying to keep tabs on what other people are doing and finding out what works. I prefer personally not to use any synthetic chemicals in the hive. But I don't go around saying to people, you know, you shall not treat your bees because, you know, I can't. Um, People have to work out their own ethics, you know. I, I can't, I can't 
I can't yeah. advise people on ethics. They have to work out themselves. It's like the the question is, um, if you think your bees are going to suffer from not treating them, then maybe it's better to give them some kind of treatment. You know, if they're going to die without them being treated, then maybe you need to do something. On the other hand, maybe. You could also say that maybe it's better to take a Darwinian approach and say, well, you know, if you're going to have a dozen colonies, then maybe eight or nine of them might die out, you know, and then maybe they, eight or nine of them get, get varroa and they can't handle it. But three or four, maybe they have varroa. They almost certainly will, well, they certainly will have varroa, but maybe they figure out a way to get by. So allowing the ones that can't cope to die out means that, that those genetic lines aren't perpetuated and the stronger bees get to breed and carry on, and they you, you breeding from stronger bees all the time, and that seems to make much more sense to me. You know, just treat them like any other animal. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good method to use. But I think a lot of um, backyard people are like devastated every time they lose a hive. So it's a, it's a sure. hard thing to do. If you've only got one or yeah. two hives, it's a very difficult hard. thing to do. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is. yeah. How many hives hard. do you have, right? And what can you afford? If you have twelve yeah, yeah. hives and you lose some of them then you can yeah. do splits and make up for them. Sure. But if you have two hives and you don't treat, you're going to lose them both. It, yep. it also comes down to money for most folks. It, yep. it, you know, look, somebody's going to solve this problem. And the right answer, the right answer is to allow the bees to learn. But from an evolution standpoint, it's going to take a serious amount of time for them to get to the point where they can cohabitate with a mite. In the meantime, sure. you're probably going to have to do something or your hive's going to die. Do splits. That's that's a great way to break the brood cycle mm -hmm. and keep the mites from going. Um, make nukes, follow the Michael Palmer method from Vermont, and do that. But if you have one or two hives and you have nothing, now I will say, I don't. I think the industry, you know, they had Kumafos and fluvolinate way back when. It killed the mites, just killed them like nuclear bombs. Yeah. They're coming out with uh, Apivar or Apa. I can't remember the name of the product. It's Amitraz. Which is yep. used a lot oh, in the U.S., it's but it's Epicard. not legal. Yeah. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And then you have Apigard, and you have the Checkmite, which is um, formic acid. You put those things in there, they're like bombs. They just nuke the whole hive. They do mm. get into the comb. They kill the mites and whatever. But I, I've seen videos of um, some of these things with formic acid where there's so many dead bees out on the landing. Mm. And I guess the question is, Whatever you can do to kill just enough mites so that the hive survives, but the bees learn to live with the mites, that's, I think, the best answer, right? These 99% kill of the mites. We think it's a great victory, but the fact of the matter is these bees better figure out how to live with the mites. They're not going away. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, the other argument is if you're treating them, you're actually slowing down evolution, aren't you? Because you're actually mm -hmm. yes. using yeah. being like a crutch to them, so... And the ones that are right. surviving are the strongest ones, to Phil's point earlier, right? So not yeah. only are we, we're, we're making the situation worse in some respects. Yeah, I just don't think a bee industry is going to let all their half their hives die, are they? It's not going to happen. Well, no, uh, of course, as, as, soon yeah. as, you bring, uh, so, so as soon as you bring commercial interests into the equation, then, you know, you, you, you don't have a choice anymore because who can afford to allow... You know, I mean, you know, we can we can maybe afford if we're hobbyists and if we've got access to swarms and things, maybe we can allow eighty percent of our bees to die. But if you've got ten thousand colonies and that's your livelihood, you know, you can't afford to let eight thousand no. of them die for sure. No, absolutely. But then that brings up the whole question of you know, is commercial beekeeping really an ethical? Um, process in the first place, and and that you know, it's it's it, as soon as you get into this argument, it becomes a very tricky one because, you know, while you can't you can you can't say that anybody has a God-given right to be a, com a commercial beekeeper. You know, it's like it's like nobody's born with a right to be to make a living out of bees. Um, but some of these guys, especially in the states, have been keeping bees for generations, and you know, it's it's heartbreaking to see them. Um, you know, looking at looking at hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of hives that have died out because of uh, pesticide poisoning. Um, but you think, well, you know, is it really a good idea to drag bees three thousand miles on the back of a truck across to the almonds and then and then 
take them across to, to Maine for the bloopers and stuff. And bees were never evolved to, to be treated like that, you know. And on the way, feed them with high fructose corn syrup and, you know, leave them in Wyoming for a few days to, to, to kind of put them in these enormous holding yards. <laughs> Absolutely, you know. It's not how bees were meant to be treated. And, no. you know, I, while I have a great sympathy for the guys who are losing their colonies, I keep thinking, well, you know, what we really need here is a complete reform of agriculture. We need to rethink the whole process from the ground up, literally the ground up. You know, we, we need to look at the soil. We need to look at the way soil uh, is the basis of everything and the, the life in the soil, including the, the microorganisms and the micronutrients, are the basis of everything on Earth, literally. All life on Earth depends on the health of that soil. And what are we doing to it? You know, we're tipping all these chemicals on it, we're tipping fertilizers on it, and herbicides on it, and insecticides on it, and then we're, we're, we're creating a situation where our farmers are literally addicted to chemicals. You know, they cannot grow anything without using these chemicals, because nothing, the, ground, the soil itself simply will not support life anymore. You know, it's just, they've killed off all the microorganisms, they've killed off everything that lives in the soil, and now the soil is simply a, a structure in which, you know, to support the roots of the plant, literally, and everything else has to come from a tanker and a spray, you know, to keep it going. And that has got to be wrong, you know, we've got to rethink this it's before it's too late, yeah. it really is. You know? Well, the other problem is they're, they're um, breeding super bugs as well, aren't they, and super weeds, so, oh, you know, God, you yes. have to pour more and more, yeah. more and more chemicals into it, so. Absolutely. You know? <clears throat> it's never ending, is it? I had a, a quick question for you, Phil. What's your weather like there right now? The weather right now, it's cold, um, fairly dry for a change, but it's, it's, uh, we're around, hovering around freezing and maybe a couple of degrees over. In so my part, that's about where it's colder. We are, right? We're just sure, we're in the yeah. same realm here in New Jersey as we have the same. I would think similar, yeah. You probably get more snow than we do. We don't, right down in the southwest of England, we rarely get much in the way of snow except on high ground. But where I am now, we practically never get snow. And Gary, I've been watching your, you guys are going gangbusters right now, right? You're in the middle, or late summer yeah. for you. Your, your, uh, both your well, podcast and your Facebook page has just been exploding with all kinds of activity. Oh yeah, it's 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 actually we're actually in a drought at the moment. There's rain for about probably four weeks. So yeah, really. and some places up north haven't rained for six or seven weeks. So it's quite bad. So yeah. there's not much flowers out there for the bees. So not good. I've been working on my season. Right, I'm building some nuke boxes and I'm building the top bar hive and I'm painting mm -hmm. some equipment. I found um, that on my property, my mother-in-law used to be a beekeeper when she lived here before we bought the house and out in the old okay. shed we found a whole uh, um, fleet of medium boxes so and Michael Bush is a big fan of this mm -hmm. I'm going to switch to all mediums for a couple hives and try that out doesn't matter whether it's a honey mm -hmm. super or not and you could use that a lot like a wear a right where you when you build your hive and when you want to open new space you mm -hmm. just tuck another one underneath and go with that and uh, I'm really looking forward to trying these different form factors and seeing yeah. what I get out of it. I think it might be possible to run a, a Langstroth as a Warre. I haven't tried it myself. I have tried running um, a, what we call a, a British National Hive as a Warre. And um, what I found was because the, uh, certainly the Langstroth box is considerably bigger than the Warre box, um, and the national box is even quite a bit bigger than the worry box. What I found is that it's very difficult to get the bees to move down, you know, because they've got so much space, they can move sideways so easily that to get them to move down is quite difficult. And I, I suspect even in a Langstroth medium, you might still have that problem. Um, that they'll live in one box, maybe two, but to get them to keep moving down, and backfilling above them. I don't know. Maybe I might be completely wrong there, but uh, you know, I'd be That's very interested to see how it turns out. That's such a question. <laughs> <laughs> because I asked that question literally the one question I asked of Michael Bush, right? The prevailing wisdom here in our region is bees move up, right? So they always tell us in the fall, <laughs> put your bees in the bottom, and that they will put the honey dome over top, and over uh -huh. winter they will 
use their stores and move up, and you'll find them underneath the bottom in the spring. Mm-hmm. You take them and you put them right back down again. Mm-hmm. And the, the wisdom of this is if they have the open space over them, they're going to store the honey over them, and the queen won't move up and lay in your honey boxes, right? That's a typical mm-hmm. Langstroth type of thing. Now, if yeah. you're doing a wary, they're talking about it moving down. If you're in a top bar, they're moving left or right, whatever you're doing. Where does a bee move? And Michael Bush's answer was, they'll move wherever there's space. Uh, yes, so absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Michael, you can trust Michael to always come up with the the perfect, simple, straightforward, common sense answer, you know. And that's exactly yeah. right. They do. They move where there's space. Yeah. You know, if there's space above them, they'll use it. If there's space below them, they'll use that. If there's space either side of them, they'll use that, you know. And, and it's like he, he says, you know, everything works if you let it. <laughs> It does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. That's that's. But not necessarily. Saying. But not necessarily the way you expect it to work. That's the thing. <laughs> because you think they're going to do it the way they're going to do it. Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely yeah. The right answer. Well, the bottom line is that bees don't read books about bees, do they? So no, you know, no, probably remember good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's One of the things we're going to do this year is we're going to, a friend of mine, and I was talking to the state apiarist about this, we're going to put scales underneath our hives. We're coming up with oh, these yeah, just yeah. simple $12, you know, um, bathroom scale and put it underneath. Sure. And it's going to weigh so we know when the nectar flow is on. And yep. um, we're going to try and find out how the data works. Like down in South Jersey, have they started yet, you know, it, mm. it diversifies even just in our state, let alone across the mid-Atlantic region of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and so on. So we're all going to mm. start our mini little experiment of putting um, excellent different yeah. weighing our hives. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Be fun yeah. this year. I'm hoping to do some experiments yeah. with um, with different sensors in the hive. We've, uh, I, I guess you probably heard there's this um, this little little baby computer called a Raspberry Pi that's just that's just been out for about a year now. But um, I've just managed to get my hands on one at last, and um, it looks like it's got the potential for monitoring quite a few things that are going on in the hive and and keeping track of them and and actually logging the data so um, I'm going to try and I've got to I've got to master the programming side of it yet but <laughs> um, I'm going to try and figure out to see if there's ways that we can use one of those to 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 record the temperature temperature variations and the humidity variations inside the hive and also any other things that I can figure out how to to keep track of weight might be I, it's probably doable. It's probably to do. It's possible to do that electronically using, um, you know, weight sensors in in certain places in the in the hive. It must be possible to do that and actually track the weight, you know, alongside the other issues of temperature and humidity and so forth. That would be a very interesting thing to do. But uh, you know, technically, it should be possible. But we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, they, they say that the higher the humidity, the varroas don't breed as well, do they? So that's I, right. I, yeah. I've got a few theories about that. So, Excuse well, me. that's 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 the kind of um, that's the kind of core of my um, approach to it. Really, is 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 allowing the bees to create an environment inside the hive that is um, perfect for them, um, and at the same time is antithetical to the to the varroa because we know that from research that varroa won't reproduce above about ninety three degrees. Fahrenheit or thirty, what's that? About thirty-two centigrade, um, mm. and and so a combination of high high temperature and high humidity inside the brood area is exactly what the bees need and want and will will make of their own accord. And that itself, if it's allowed to remain constant, in other words, if you don't fiddle with it, if you don't interfere with it, or you know take the take the the the, the frames apart and so forth. Um, if the bees can maintain that temperature and humidity, that should in itself have a detrimental effect on, on the varroa. But of course, you know, the way beekeeping is generally taught over here is that you have to go through your hive every week to, to cut out queen cells to stop the thing swarming. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what that's exactly what the bees don't want you to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, make, yep, interfere yeah. with the environment all the time. Yeah, Kevin said you break all the seals, all the propolis seals, and uh, reduce the temperature and let the atmosphere out and everything. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, been, we've been so busy building beehives for customers that we haven't had a chance to uh, look at our bees for a while, so they're, probably, they're doing okay by themselves, so... You know, sometimes mm-hmm. it's better leave them alone, isn't it? I, I think, yeah. yeah. You know, leave them alone. If, if in doubt, leave them alone. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. Funny. There's a beekeeper taking that premise in South America. His name is Oscar Perón. Oh, He's yeah, yeah. I know Oscar. Oscar. Right? And you, I've seen videos. I don't know if they come from yeah. you or somebody else in UK who's taking this approach. Right? And his, um, there's his a, there's thing a, yeah. is you Go ahead. A chamber in the bottom, and you put mm-hmm. the bees in the, in the chamber... And then you put the boxes on the top, and you never interfere That's right. with the chamber at the bottom. That's right. And they yeah. create their own ecology, and they control their humidity, and they control their heat. The other thing that he did was he changed the size of the cell, right? Small cell is supposed to... It came in vogue for a while, small cell, and then it went out because all the scientists said it wasn't there. But the key thing mm-hmm. about small cell is the bees do not take as long to pupate, Right. There's 21 day mm-hmm. incubation period for that, but in small cell it's like 19 days, and it mm. and it is the length of time that the varroa has to reproduce inside the cell. Mm-hmm. So it's coming back in vogue, at least that's what I understand. And the other thing is about the space inside the hive. I think what his theory is is that the conventional Langstroth hive, the dimensions are too big. If you close the dimensions, it increases the interior of the hive up a degree or two or three. And as you were saying before, Phil, it changes the heat and the varroa can't tolerate mm-hmm. it, right? So mm-hmm. he's changing the way the hive construction is going with this Perone hive and mm. thinks the science is going to take care of the varroa problem now. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I've got a, I've got, I, I'm running a couple of, um, uh, modified dadens, a couple of uh, old uh, Brother Adam hives, uh, in in a Peron style. In other words, I'm just allowing them to do what they like in, inside three brood boxes, um, and giving them all the space they need just to just to kind of build this huge nest. I hope. <laughs> um, and the idea is, as you say, you put boxes, you put the supers on top, and then you just leave. Um, you, I think you leave one super for the bees, and then you take what's above that. But um, I had one of them die out on me towards the end of last year, and I, I really don't know, know why. They seem to have absconded. But um, I think it's it's another approach, and it's worth, you know, it's any, anything that is worth experimenting with at the moment, really, to find out what the answer can could possibly be. Um, I understand that Oscar has gone into retirement. At least he seems to have disappeared from forums and things lately. But uh, yeah. there are some people in this country yeah, experimenting with his approach. Yeah. Yeah, he's been contributing to a forum that I'm on, and and I haven't seen him in quite a while. But yeah, it could just be that you know they're they're in break right now, like us. And uh, maybe well, he I had an email from him um, a few months ago now. I think it was certainly before Christmas last year, saying that he was you know he it was slightly mysterious and a bit cryptic, saying that he was he was retiring, but you know sort of don't don't expect him to disappear altogether, kind of thing. But you know, I hope he'll be back, and I hope he'll come up with uh, new stuff. Yeah, well, anything you plan to see, right? Yeah. Well, it was interesting. Last last winter, we had a hive with a quilt level on the top, and the varroa mites didn't actually uh, reproduce hardly at all. So I was sorry, sorry, I Gary. Say that again. You had a, you had a hive with uh, what on the top? Oh, it's got a quilt level. You know, like quilt a like a worry level. hive has. Yeah, you know how a worry hive's got a quilt level. Like a quilt. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, 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 I got you. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's like, we've got a bit of canvas on the bottom, and yep. um, like sawdust or wood chips in it, and sure. the, it's, it's designed to get rid of the um, condensation, and I'm just thinking that because possibly the bees were colder, because it was more ventilated, they actually clustered more, and the mites didn't breed as much. As much. I mean, we're not scientists, but it's um, it definitely reduced the, the varroa mites, so it's interesting, isn't it? And that was the same. That was a hive that bounced dramatically back in the spring. So, yeah, really. I I have those up on my. I created this box. I don't know if you've seen in the U.S. They they sell them. Uh, a lot of the beekeeper catalogs sell this box that has three holes in the side, and mm-hmm. it has a styrofoam insert, and it has a hole in the middle that you could pop out and put a feeder in, like an upside down okay. jar. Okay. I I looked at that and said, you know, one of the things that people discussed, even. So my first recollection is 
I bought a hive, and it had a plastic top cover. And every mm. time I moved that plastic top cover, there was a puddle on there. So I mm -hmm. know that's a no-go, right? And then mm -hmm. I saw yeah. a video with one of these boxes with the styrofoam on the top, and the premise was it was sitting next to a hive that had no no styrofoam top, and the snow was all melted on the top of it. Mm -hmm. The one with the styrofoam, the snow was four inches high. So sure. I took the idea of a quilt box and the styrofoam. I built a deeper box. It has a queen excluder, a plastic one, like a $2 one on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And in the top of it, it has styrofoam. And then there's an open chamber about three to four inches with a space between the styrofoam and the queen excluder. And I tore mm -hmm. newspaper and I put it in there. And mm -hmm. I have it sitting on top. And the premise is this. The warm, moist air will come up to the top. And if it hits the top and it's cold and condenses and drips, it will drip on the newspaper and the newspaper will accept the moisture and it won't drip back down on the hive, on the bees and whatever. Mm -hmm. I've been using yeah, these for the that last makes sense. And they seem to work pretty well. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of success with them. Look, yeah. They're ugly, yeah, but they, they work funny. Well. Mm. Yeah. And the theory is that the water hits the tin roof and the drips go on the sawdust or the newspaper, don't they? And they mm. dry out through the holes. So, yeah, we've had yeah. some success with that. Mm. Well, I guess um, my approach is 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 kind of similar to that, but I I work on the on the basis that um, condensation will only happen on a cool surface. Yeah, cool in comparison yeah. to the air itself. So, if the um, in a top bar hive, if the bars themselves are have insulation above them, in other words, it's like the you know there's a, there's a loft above them, as it were. As long as you've got that loft well insulated, the bars are going to be warmed by the the fact that there are bees under there, you know, generating some heat. So that the air is going to convect across the top bars, and then it's going to hit the sides of the hive, and that's yeah. where it's going to condense, and then it's going to run down the sides and run out the bottom. So. Um, you know that that's the theory. You know, <laughs> I can't prove yeah. it. Yet. I haven't yeah, got a camera in the there, but you know, we're missing from from a Langstroth hive is it's not a tree, right? A tree sure. has a chamber in the side with uh, the bark and the cambium, and the water flows through the water jacket in the tree, and all yep. of that stuff kind of regulates the temperature. Mm -hmm. Langstroth hive is a three quarter inch shell, and that's it. You know what I mean? So yep. I have I've been saying this forever is. One of the reasons I'm trying all these different hive form factors is at some point I want to go off and build a new hive, a different form factor. There's mm. got to be, I'm, I don't understand why people haven't tried to take on improving the Langstroth hive in, mm. in the ability of heat management, ventilation, and all this other stuff. Mm. Maybe, you, Phil, you've seen these at the ABF show in Hershey, they had styrofoam boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen them being used here for a long time, but they're new ones. Yeah. They're made out of a harder, denser styrofoam. You mm. almost mm. can't pinch them and squeeze them. And then they yeah. took the stuff that you put in a bed liner, that black, tarry stuff that is supposed mm -hmm. to prevent a bed liner, and they sprayed them with these to make them impervious. Uh, okay. Right. And I have to wonder, I'm, I'm so fascinated to go buy one of these things, like everything else, and try one and see how they work. I know a beekeeper sure. who used the previous form factor styrofoam ones the squirrels ate them the the yeah, yeah. the ants got through it, it just it was a disaster they didn't mm. work the skunks ate them and whatever i i don't know if these would suffer the same fate but it'd be interesting to know whether they regulate the temperature differently I think they do. Um, I've I've seen them in use. I've seen a, I visited a. I did, in fact, I did a podcast interview with a with a, a Scottish beekeeper called Murray McGregor, who uses these hives routinely now, uh, with um, with a breed of bee that's actually raised in New Zealand. Funnily enough, um, but it's a Northern European bee that's that's raised uh, over winter in New Zealand. But um, they they they. I must say. Um, I'm, I was skeptical at first, and I still have a lot of reservations from the environmental point of view about using styrofoam because of the toxic pr products yeah. uh, given off when it's being made and so forth, and the difficulty of disposing with it afterwards. But aside from that, what it does do is create a 
very well insulated container and i think that's what bees really like to have you know and a, your average hollow tree probably has you know two or three inches of of of, of rotten wood around it yep. you know and which is a really really good insulator and it's got like any number of feet of timber directly above it which is a perfect insulator and so to put them inside a you know a box made of half inch timber or whatever it, it it's just like so so not like a hollow tree that uh, which is why I always recommend people use at least inch you know inch thick timber to build their hives just to give them that extra little bit of um, insulation but you complete you're quite right you know you can't compare any beehive to a hollow tree um, uh, unless, of course, it is a hollow tree, because there are people in southwest France still using um, right. hollow right. chestnut logs, you know, as hives, and they work very well. <laughs> yeah, I've seen photos of those. They're fascinating, aren't they? Yeah. Must be hard to you move them, to, but... You have, to, you have to take the styrofoam hives. So the common thing is, in the wintertime, the hive is not the same temperature as, you know, it's not 98 degrees in there. It's whatever the ambient temperature is, and then in a bubble around the actual, uh, um, around the cluster itself is where the heat is, and they generate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You would think inside that, that they would probably maintain the, the temperature a little more consistently inside, and it's all about the amount of resources, right? Every one of those bees that's in there doing aerobics to try and keep the cluster warm and generate that heat. Mm-hmm. The less heat they have to generate, the more chance they have for survival. For sure, and, yeah. And, and the less food they eat. In the summertime, they maintain the heat by bringing in moisture and evaporating it like an air conditioner or whatever. So they completely can climate control it. And if yeah. they can keep the fluctuation up and down for when it's super hot out or super cold out, yeah. it just seems like there's got to be a better way to uh, maintain the environment inside the hive for them. For sure, yeah, and that that brings me you know, to what I said really well, you know, in the, my opening remarks, really, is that um, creating a space that the bees can really control themselves is the way I'm I'm working now. It's really you know going going for that in every possible way, um, in terms of insulation, in terms of the thickness of the timber used, in terms of creating an environment where other things can live, because you know the, again. A possible issue with the styrofoam is that it is pretty much a sterile environment. Nothing else as much is going to live in there alongside the bees because there's no little nooks and crannies for them to, to kind of crawl into. So that might be an issue. I don't know. Um, but maybe you can get around that by having a, you know, a box of um, sawdust or, or something at the bottom of the styrofoam hive, you know, where all those things can live. Uh, you know, there's all, all sorts of possibilities we haven't investigated yet. I think the original Langstroth hive actually was double skinned anyway, wasn't it? In the original design. I think I, the, the one I've seen pictures not, of, yeah. yeah, the the one I've seen pictures of had kind of hinged parts. It was like in, it, there seemed to be like in three three hinged sections. Um, I haven't tried to recreate one of those, but uh, I think it, I think you're right. I think the because it, it was designed with sections in mind. I think wasn't it originally rather than, yeah. this, rather than it was a double wall. Lorenzo uh -huh. Langstroth's original design was double wall, and it also, right. he had some sort of, his, his vision was that there was some sort of embankment that the hive sat up under, and he was channeling air underneath to do an airflow, some sort of airflow thing. You can download that book, it's a free audio book, and I listened to it a couple times, and uh -huh. there is that whole aspect of... Um, he had a double wall hive with an insulation space in between, and he was providing ventilation underneath. So he mm. got it. We just moved away from it for commercialization, sure. I think. Sure. Also, he, he had like a mesh put underneath today, kind of thing. He mm, had it up on an embankment so that air could flow <laughs> underneath the hive and around it was my, mm -hmm. my take yeah. on what I heard. Yeah, I, th I think the design has changed to make it easier to move them and, you know, more commercial uses, aren't they? Oh, it's been simplified, time. definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, cool. It is a Gary, efficient system. I mean, you got to say it is. It is what it is. Sure. Absolutely. Yep. What, what was that, Phil? Gary, you, you've got a you've got a note saying that we have a question. Was was that one we've already dealt with, or? Oh, that was the one from. Um, okay. Yeah, we've dealt with that guy. Yeah. Mm. That was from Paul, Paul Vandenbosch, yeah. I just asked about if anyone else has got any questions and no, one, no one's come back, so. Okay. 
Well, it, something I get asked a lot um, is 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 where do you get bees from? And I was just wondering if you guys um, have do you have much in the way of natural swarms around you? When I say natural, I mean you know swarms that that occur whether they come from beehives or whether they come from hollow trees. But do you have much going on in the way of swarm catching in the season? Yeah, we we do absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, the beginning of the season, we had four in two days, so it's full on. It uh, hasn't mm-hmm. it's stopped now. It's um, yeah, we do get a lot of swarms, especially in mm-hmm. in suburban areas where people have hives in their backyard and they don't look after them properly, mm-hmm. and they all split off. But I mean, a swarming hive is a good sign, really. It means they're healthy, doesn't it? Well, I would say so. Yeah. Yep. Mm. What about you, what about you, Kevin? Do you do you get much in the way of natural swarms around you? I hear. Uh I hear beekeepers all the time talking about collecting swarms and swarms and swarms. I've only seen two in the last number of years in my area. I mm-hmm. have um, a commercial guy has a couple dozen hives right like a mile and something from my apiary, and mm. um, I, I think I've three, maybe four in my neighborhood in the last three years. Mm. So okay, but there's other people who talk about collecting, you know, twenty a week sometimes when the season's mm. really going. Yeah, I've been trying not to let my hives swarm. I've been splitting them and <laughs> doing whatever and doing whatever management. The other thing is I might be blissfully unaware, right? Because I go to work during the day, and if they're swarming, mm. good for them. <laughs> no, it happens. Pop- <laughs> yeah. Populating nature, right? Which is always oh, it, it, yeah, it, yeah. You can tell, but because you inspect it one week, and then two weeks later you inspect it, and half the and half the bees are gone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I see this way as long as they're not hanging off my neighbor's eaves. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, if they call me and a... these are in their garage or something like that, then I guess yeah. I'll do a little better job at managing. Mm. Or, or hanging on their wing mirror and they want to go to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, hanging off their mailbox or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Would well, you get many natural swarms of you live, Phil, or is it um, not really? We do. Yeah, we do get a lot of swarms, actually. Um, it... it, it Last year it was concentrated into quite a narrow gap because we had such rubbish weather that um, it's like the bees just waited for the first bit of sun and they all just decided to swarm you know, pretty much in the same week. And um, we we literally had, I think in one week, we must have had probably over 20 swarms within 10 miles of here. Uh, that's the ones I know about. I mean, you know, they're, they're, those, those are the ones that called me. <laughs> you know, there, there would have been a lot more than that that didn't call me, so... No. Yeah, but there's a lot of beekeepers in this area. You know, we we are a we're a small country, and we're 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 quite heavily populated. And I live in a an area which is not 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 overly po- heavily populated. But there's you know there's quite a few beekeepers here because the climate's quite good for it. And you know, as I said, Brother Adam's operation was only six seven miles away, and we've got and and Devon is the oldest beekeeping association in the country. I think I'm right in saying. So, you know, there are a lot of beekeepers around here, and, uh, you know, some of them are going to have swarms. There's no, quite no question. So we do get a lot, and it, uh, and that's good. I think, I, I, you know, the more swarms, the better, really, because, um, as, as uh, Kevin said, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, giving them a chance to find somewhere out in the woods to live, and those bees are going to be the genetic pool that we draw on in future years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've noticed this year we've had a lot of people complaining that bees are living in their roofs, mm-hmm. which is something new. I've had about four or five complaints. So, but um, I don't. I tend not to take those on because I think it's you, you kind of be then you become responsible for the building of their house. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's a tricky one. It's sort of it's hard to do. Yeah. Given that yeah, brother so, so what, back here there by you, um, is there is there public programs to educate people? on how important that area is? Uh, no. <laughs> there, so, no, not, nothing in the way of a public program. But there, unaware, there's, there's, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, even, even the Abbey, uh, to be honest, I don't think they value their heritage as much as they should. You know, they, they, they really should have a, a decent um, you know, museum there, I think, to... to, to with all of Brother Adam's old equipment in it, you know, because I worked there for a year and we used a lot of his stuff and we used, um, you know, his uh, 
his his old beekeeping hat and his uh, his, his uh, cassock were hang, hanging up in the cupboard there, you know, and they've been there for years. Who knows where they are now? Oh, cool but that. all that stuff, you know, that that really should have been preserved and looked after. I don't know. I hope it has been. The uh, Lorenzo Langstroth was from Philadelphia, and they mm. had a little plaque and a sign. And they just celebrated an anniversary there, the Philadelphia Beekeepers Guild. But that's all there is. This is where he lived, and here's sure. the sign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's probably more than Brother Adam's got, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> he's he's buried in the Abbey's grounds, and you can visit his grave. But you know, there's no big signs up anywhere saying. Uh, no, they got a little. They got a little exhibition, I think, there. But it's it's well out of date. The last time I saw it, it was. Yeah. Because when we, we did he pass away? It was not that long ago, eh? It's quite. Oh, it was back in I think it was about nineteen ninety two or three, around that time. He yeah. died. I never met him. Sadly, I'd lo- love to have met him now, but uh, in those days, I wasn't really that even that interested in beekeeping. So, you know, it's before the time I got I got that interested in it. So, uh, okay. There you go. But I do know his um, a, a, a guy who worked with him for many years, Peter Donovan. Um, and also Brother Daniel at the Abbey, who worked with Brother Adam for many years, and, and I, I've met and spoken to both of them, and you know found out quite a lot about him from them. So I've got kind of, if not first hand, at least second hand <laughs> knowledge of, of some of his uh, some of his stuff. Yeah, yeah it's good. Because yeah, wasn't Langstroth a uh, uh, reverend as well? That is neat, though. That, that you're right there immersed. I mean, as a beekeeper, you can appreciate it, right? <laughs> Sure, yeah, yeah. I can now, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, well, should we, um, do, do we wrap that up now? Do you want to do something else, Kevin or Phil? Um, I'd like, I haven't actually heard Kevin's podcast yet. I have to, I have to own up to that. <laughs> I've, I've listened to some okay. of yours, Gary, but I haven't actually listened to Kevin's yet, so I'd like to know um, the web address for your podcast, please, Kevin. Uh, oh, yeah, we, we could do that, yeah www.bkcorner.org stands for bkcorner.org bkcorner.org okay and you're on are you on iTunes I am yeah okay good I'll look for you on iTunes as well thanks to Gary and uh, you know one of the things I wanted to I was listening to your podcast um, Phil recently where you interviewed the person with the discs that was fascinating, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that was I interesting. To your, I Rick, forgot, remind me, uh, the, the person was. with the, the discs. The person who had the, the discs next to the hive that changed the energy. Oh, Valerie. Yes, Valerie Solheim. Yes. Yeah, she was, I interviewed her when I was over over in the States last November in, um, in uh, Denver, Colorado. And, um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I don't know whether there, is there something in that. I hope there is. I kind of hope there is. Um, it, 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 when I first heard about it, I, I kind of thought, oh wow, this is really bizarre. <laughs> I thought, yeah. you know, but the, but talking to her and listening to her and thinking it through and thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something in it. You know, um, I'd certainly like, like to hear more about it. Science, right? Put a control. <laughs> like, on well, you know, those are the you have to at some point. Like that need to to know, right? So that they can, yeah. you know, how could you yeah, be I mean, credible without having a way to present it that people who would evaluate you would sure. say, yes, that makes sense, whatever. But sure. it was a fascinating Absolutely. topic. I started thinking yeah. about like NASCAR lines and all that other stuff, right? It, it uh-huh. does make you think. Mm-hmm. And, well, if, and if, if it works, I mean, our, do it. Our podcasts are completely different, right? So you do a lot of interviews. And, and you do some commentary, Gary. You're mm. you're with Margaret doing your uh, teamwork thing, and I'm talking about stuff that we got going on just generally in our association and, and personally in my backyard. And um, w- we do have different styles. I don't think I've I have very few interviews, uh, mm. although I'd like to change that at some point. But it is neat that the three of us, I think, are the most active podcasters. Going. I don't know of any other. Um, what would you say it's like, you know, Craig from Maryland? He used to. That's do Craig. Yeah, he yeah. Not been around much. Uh, we're, yeah. we're really the active ones, and we all have complementary styles. 
three different places. I think it's great. I refer people to your podcasts, both of you, mm -hmm. all the time. So. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Well, I, should, I should definitely be listening to yours, Kevin. Um, I, I've been very bad about uh, by, about keeping track of other people's podcasts all the time. I I have been listening to Craig's, and he did come back recently, didn't he? He, he did a he did a bit of a comeback at the beginning of the year because he'd had a long he did a time off. Thirty first issue, and I think that's um, then he fell by the wayside. So maybe has that been it again so far? Okay, he'll he'll come back in. Sure, sure. Yeah, he's got. I, I'm a hoping great, to make more my more regular. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. I'm hoping to do yeah. more, but it, it's just finding the time to fit everything in. You know, I've got, I've got, st <laughs> I've got stuff stacked up waiting for me to to give attention to. I've got videos to edit from last year. I've got books to finish, and oh man, you know, <laughs> it's so hard to fit it all in. Yeah, we've only got 168 hours each, haven't we, every year, week? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and some of those well, I have to sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Got to got to have some fun as well, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so oh, tell me, I, 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 I sort of vaguely yeah. remember fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, I do I this watch. just enough to make sure that I keep it fun, right? I, I don't know sure. if I'd yeah. become a professional at this because, you know, it would just lose its charm. You do it to the extent yeah, that you I want. Can. Sometimes it gets burdening, like you said, Phil. I have <laughs> stacks of videos and whatever. I shoot a lot for a video for a YouTube mm. channel that we maintain, and um, mm -hmm. there's never, never a want for things to do to oh, no. media, right? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm really, I'm happy to say that I've got a lot of teaching work to do this year. I've got, um, I've got pretty much every other weekend right through the summer, right through till September. I'm, I'm out teaching somewhere. And uh, which is great. I really enjoy teaching, and it, it, I mean the best thing is is you get to meet other people that are doing stuff, you know, and get to talk to them and learn from them. And um, the one thing that's I suppose the if, if there's a bit of big news it would be that I, I was invited to teach at um, Highgrove, which is Prince Charles's um, residence in, in 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 Gloucestershire. So. Um, I'm hoping to get a, a little badge for my car saying, you know, by royal appointment. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Maybe one day, you know, you know it won't happen, but whatever. <laughs> but it's, it's what it, what's <laughs> great is that, you know, to have, to, that, that, that he has, um, actually recognized the existence of, um, natural beekeeping has been recognized at that level. Um, yeah. and, you know, that we're, that we it's kind of, it's kind of a, if, if you like a, a semi semi official acknowledgement that that, that that we're not completely barking mad <laughs> exactly yeah he was here rec he was here with Camilla recently and uh they went uh -huh. visited some bee stuff as well did some bee stuff here so right I've, I've seen some photos but I wasn't actually there but that's fantastic Phil that you can you know well, get I'm out hoping there to bump into him stuff. in the garden one day you know when I'm when I'm up there but we'll see <laughs> yeah Maybe we'll do a podcast interview. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? That's exactly. The way to do it. <laughs> Always playing the interview, right? Yeah, just keep that tape deck, tape deck in your back pocket all the time. Oh yeah, you never know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And so, so where can people get hold of your podcast, Phil? You're on iTunes and everything. Uh, yeah, it's on iTunes. It's the bare, it's Just look up the Barefoot Beekeeper. You'll find it on iTunes. It's on. I I use Libsyn. Do you? Use, I guess you guys probably do as well. Liberated Syndication. <laughs> Yeah, for the yeah, actual, you yeah. So, so yeah, you know, buy a dot com or just go to iTunes and um, look it up there. But okay. I, I do a, I do an RSS feed to my website as well, so the latest one should appear automatically on on the website with any luck. Yeah, because you're at uh, buy dot com, is that right? That's, That's right. Your main website. Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll uh, stay online there, guys, but we'll just end the broadcast. And uh, okay. so, in, could, do you have any, got anything else to say there, Kevin? No? No. Nope. Okay, we're all right. Okay, we well, thanks everyone for joining us. Yeah, no, me too. Thanks everyone for joining yeah, us. Good to meet and, you guys. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we'll uh, probably do another talk at some other point. So, you, you guys stay on the line, I'll just end this broadcast. <laughs>